aboard this episode of Mythbusters. Welcome back, Pirates. It's the Pirates Special Sequel. Our very own Pirates of the Caribbean once again plunder and pillage for Pirate Parable. First, Adam and Jamie tackle the movie-inspired myth of the pirate submarine. This is either madness or brilliant. Then Carrie and Grant bury Tori alive. Oh, gee, he's up to his knees. To find out... Oh, fiddle, we're up to your middle. If you can escape... Oh, heck, I'm up to his neck. A terrifying death sentence. And finally, more Caribbean chaos as Adam and Jamie... What do you mean we ain't got no cannibals? ...investigate the ballistic properties of improvised ammo. Who are the Mythbusters? Yeehaw! Adam Savage. Time for science! And Jamie Heineman. Is that beautiful or what? Between them, more than 30 years of special effects experience. It bleeds. Let's go. Joining them, Grant Imahara. Don't give up on me now. Tori Bellacci. Oh. And that's how we like it. And Carrie Byron. High explosives and electricity. Woo! They don't just tell the myths, they put them to the test. we haven't done enough pirate myths. Who says we have an old run them straight through the scurvy dogs? The fans. In the hordes of them. Wait, wait, wait. Instead of killing them all, why don't we take a few more suggestions? Right, and do a Mythbusters pirate special number two. Another excuse to not bathe for weeks. <laughs> the last time the Mythbusters stopped bathing, four maritime myths walked the plank. Slowing a fall with a knife sail hit the deck. And rum as a stain remover was... Ah, uh, busted! So was the nautical notion that wooden shrapnel from a cannonball was lethal. The team finally saw the light with eye patch as a night vision aid. That was like yes, night and yes. red! But this veritable feast of fables merely scratched the surface. Seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, three. Ah, oh, you threw off my count. You're too much of a landlubber to be in that outfit. You get seasick. I don't need to go on the sea for this technique, Jamie. Check this out. It's a pirate submarine. I take a rowboat and turn it upside down, and I get inside, and I walk from the shore into the water, and the rowboat keeps a pocket of air so I can make my way out to my enemies and deal with them in a way they would never see coming. I'm not so sure about that. That sounds like a myth to me. Well, that's what we're here to find out. In need of a quick escape, our irrepressible hero flips a rowboat to use as a submarine. But in the real world, would this fun-filled filmic fable go belly up? What's the plan, Adam? Well, I'm glad you've asked it, my non-pirate friend. I've thought about this at length, and I've considered that since I get sick on the sea, I'd like to do this whole experiment in a swimming pool. OK, well, we'll get, like, some ramps that we can walk down into the pool with, and we got to find a boat. Exactly. <laughs> Because of Adam's history of hurling on the high seas, the team drop anchor in the calm waters of the Fremont Pool in Oakland. Okay, if you can push. En route, they stopped in at the rowboat store, which means they have all they need to recreate the mythical movie scene in question. Using a ramp, they'll walk the upturned boat into the shallow end of the pool before heading out of their depth to test its submarine-like properties. Oh, bloody hell, that's heavy. Oh, oh my God, that's really heavy. Ah, it's getting lighter. Ah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. There we go. Let's move forward. Come on. With the weight supported on the water surface, our potential submariners begin their descent. OK, here we get into deeper water. We'll find out if the boat comes with us. Are you? Okay. 
actually like I'm, I'm sort of floating. Me too, I'm not. I'm, I'm not, holding on to the boat. I'm holding on to it and I'm floating. There's nothing going on. <laughs> That's a good shot. Well, the first test went as well as could be expected. The, uh, the, there is indeed a uh, breathable pocket of air in the boat, but the boat didn't sink. Well, that didn't work at all. The myth is that the boat will go under the surface of the water like a diving bell, like a primitive submarine so you can conceal yourself from your enemies, and that didn't happen to us here. Nope, our not-so-stealthy pirates were left high and wet. But despite their failure, Adam isn't ready to consign this myth to Davy Jones' locker quite yet. Here's the problem. Humans are neutrally buoyant. When we go into the water being mostly water, we don't weigh anything. We're not applying any downforce to this boat. But in our research, we turned up that pirates wore tons of crap, cutlasses and cuirasses and daggers and blunderbusses and all that sort of stuff. And specifically, Yellowbeard was supposed to have worn 30 pounds of stuff. 30 pounds. Awesome. There you go, buddy. So Jamie and I are going to put 30 pounds each on our bodies, try this test again, and see if we get any more of a positive result. All right, let's make our way out to deep waters. Adam and Jamie, with 60 pounds of pirate bling and weaponry, once again attempt to slide beneath the water in their makeshift submersible. But will the excess baggage help? <laughs> Here we are again. Here we go again. <laughs> While Adam and Jamie head for deeper waters, why don't we join Carrie, Grant, and Tori for a mythical pirate torture technique? The myth we're working on is called sand necktie. Aye, that be pirate fashion? Actually, this one's about sand. The idea is that pirates would bury their prisoners up to the neck at the shore at low tide, so when the tide came in, they'd drown a torturous death. So what we're looking at is whether you can escape or not, right? Exactly. It's a myth with a morbid fascination. Buried alive with water views. But is the pirate sand necktie really a certain death sentence? Or could you dig your way out of your vertical, shallow grave? OK, so what's the plan? Well, some people think it's not the drowning that killed the prisoners, but the pressure of the sand, that it would just it'd close in around you like a boa constrictor. Well, that sounds pretty easy. So we go to the beach, we dig a big hole, we put Tori in and see if he passes out. If he doesn't pass out, then we can see if he escapes. Wait, don't I get a say in this at all? No. No. So it's a simple plan that involves Cap'n Limpy and cabin boy Imahara burying Tortuga Tori to the neck. Hey, there's the X mark the spot. Oh, there's the treasure. There's the treasure. All right, start digging, mates. First up, a vertical grave. Why am I digging my own hole? Well away from the rising tide for safety, from which Tori will attempt to escape. That's if he doesn't suffocate from the constriction first. I don't have time to deal with that ye olde pirate trick where you have to use a shovel to dig a hole. We're in a modern world, we're modern people, and I'm a modern pirate. I'm using heavy machinery. You know, watching Carrie dig this ditch and knowing that I'm gonna be up to my neck in sand, um, it's kind of like watching her dig my grave. I hope I don't regret saying that. You could say Tori's got some grave depths. Uh, Perfect, right up to your neck. Uh, That's good. Is it though? You know, if you do start to freak out, it's gonna take us a while to get you out. That's my big concern, is if something does go wrong, it's not going to be just like a quick pull me out of the sand. I'm stuck. As a precaution against hypothermia, Tori will wear a wetsuit. <sighs> Why am I doing this? Can somebody tell me? No, but how about giving us a prediction just the same? My prediction? Uh, I'm going to get buried up to my neck, and I won't be able to move at all. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get out. I think I'm going to freak out. Call everybody to come in and dig me out. You're going to be OK. You'll be fine. We're going to be here the entire time. Let's get this over with. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, Tori, to the untrained eye, it looks a lot like you're being buried alive. Oh, no, he's up to his toes. Oh, gee, he's up to his knees. With torturing Tori on the agenda, Carrie and Grant are as happy as any pirate could be. Strangely, Tori isn't having nearly as much fun. All right, I'm, I'm probably going to check out a little bit, so don't be offended if I don't answer your questions. I'm just, 
I'm trying to uh, remain calm here. All right, dude, totally. Calm breathing will be important because, as Sanjay explains, another name for this myth could be dead man's chest. Well, one of the biggest problems I can see is that as we breathe, our chest wall expands to allow our lungs to expand to have the air exchange happen in our lungs. Well, with the sand up against his chest and all that pressure, he's not going to be able to take uh, normal size uh, breaths. Uh, he'll become lethargic, slow to respond, he'll look around, and he'll become a little bit more, less and less uh, with it. It touches on all of the major phobias and fears, being buried alive, drowning, claustrophobia. I mean, he's, he's, he's in a hole. The tide is coming in. To imagine a pirate having to die this way, it's terrifying. Cue Captain Limpy. Oh, fiddle, we're up to your middle. And her buried alive verse. I've been a bad pirate. Sung to cheer up her captive audience. Oh, heck, I'm up to his neck. Before giving Tori the go-ahead to begin his escape attempt, and not content with taunting and tickling, tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> you suck. Carrie decides to bring to the party what she likes to call motivation. <laughs> oh, they're alive! <laughs> oh, dude! <laughs> He's looking at me! Hey, he's looking at me. What's up, buddy? In danger of becoming crab meat. Quickly, Tori, I'm hungry. You look delicious. And with some concern for his constricted rib cage. I can breathe, like, but I can't really take a deep breath. It's just kind of like. Carrie and Grant start the clock on Tori's escape attempt. OK, I'm ready to go. All right, what I'm doing right now is I'm just wiggling my fingers just to kind of make room for my hand and see if I can uh, actually free my arm. That's funny, because it just doesn't look like you're moving at all. And that's a problem, because in addition to his fear of small rodents and the color purple, it turns out he doesn't like being buried alive. OK, can you guys be ready with shovels? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm noticing that as I'm realizing that I can't move, that it's starting to freak me out. It's the Mythbusters Pirate Special sequel. <laughs> okay. yeah. there we go. Adam and Jamie have already failed to turn an upturned rowboat into a makeshift submarine. They're simply too buoyant and couldn't pull the boat to the bottom of the pool. But they're about to find out if 60 pounds of pirate accessories are enough ballast to sink them and their precious pocket of air. Well, they got to step on an octopus. There we go. OK, here we go. Here we go. Oh, OK, full. Come on. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> not happening. No, not happening. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty much the same as it was the last time. Pretty much exactly the same. <laughs> well, what do you think? I, I, I think this one's a bust. Yeah. I think this, you know, okay, so we added an extra 60 pounds. Yeah. I think there's a lot more than 60 pounds of displacement here. I'd like to find out exactly how much. With the myth sinking fast, the guys want some answers. And to get them, they've got another test in mind. And this time, wearing scuba gear, they're going down with the boat. Let's say you're on the bottom of the ocean with a boat full of air. Could you even remotely hold on to it? What we're going to do to test this is we're going to anchor ourselves to the bottom of this pool, about 500 pounds of barbell weights. We're going to put the boat down there full of water and fill it with air and see if we can hold on to it while it's got enough air for us to breathe in. This will be the definitive test. If they can't hold down their pirate submarine with all that extra weight, the myth's a bust. You ready to do this? Everything's set up. Yeah. At the bottom, they anchor themselves to a quarter ton of barbells, grab hold of the boat, and then blow bubbles into the reservoir above them, filling it with the smallest of breathable air pockets. But they just can't hang on, and this myth floats off to wherever busted myths float off to. All right, so I'd like to point something out about this experiment. Let's take a look at some footage of our boat on the bottom. Okay, you see how we've got barbell weights hanging from the boat itself? 
We had to put 200 pounds onto the boat just to offset the buoyancy of the wood before we even got air into it. That's how much buoyancy we're talking about. Then you put air in and Jamie and I couldn't hold onto it with 500 pounds. There is no way that under anything remotely approaching a normal circumstance, a human could hold a breathable pocket of air by himself at the bottom of the ocean. Well, something tells me we're not quite done yet, though. Oh, no. Yes, they're going to appease the curiosity gods by running the numbers. I think it's time to quantify just how much weight it's going to take to hold that boat down. The way we're going to find that out is by filling it with water and weighing, keeping track of the weight of the water that we put into it until it sinks. Okay, it's a complicated thing, but basically, Adam and Jamie are going to flip this myth on its head. By overcoming the boat's buoyancy, they'll know how much force or weight it would take to hold down a boat full of air. So there's going to be a whole lot of bailing in reverse. Hey. Each of these buckets holds 40 pounds of water. 40. And after 2,000 pounds of H2O and barbells. Yeah, that's it. Now it's coming over the side over there. Adam and Jamie know exactly why this myth is sunk. All right, so it took 2,000 pounds of water and barbell weights combined to sink this boat. In practical terms, what that means is if you're trying to hold this boat upside down, full of air at the bottom of the ocean, that there's 2,000 pounds of force pulling upwards. So that even if you were Jabba the Hutt and weighed enough to hold the boat down, your arms would still have an out-of-body experience. They would be ripped out of their sockets. You couldn't do it. And for all of you eagle-eyed scientists out there, if the team had carried out the tests in salt water, it would only have increased the buoyancy of the boat, making it harder to hold down. So there's just one outstanding question. How did Captain Jack Sparrow do it in the movie? We proved it's not possible in reality. I think it's about time we show how they do it in the movies. Absolutely. Through careful editing and a choice of shots, let's demonstrate how Hollywood makes the impossible possible. The sequence has three key shots, entering the water, the submerged walk at the bottom of the ocean, and finally, the pirates safe in their air bubble. Shot the first. Pirates Jamie and Adam seeking to evade detection walk their boat into the water. Here we go. This one's pretty simple. No special effects needed here. Oh, I think it's working. Right, shot the second. Pre-drilled holes and weight to make the boat sink. Jamie and Adam inside with special small air tanks. Ready? Here we go. With a neutrally buoyant boat and concealed air tanks, our pirates can defy physics and walk their submersible along the ocean floor. Shot number three. Jamie and Adam, the pirates, from inside the boat. You ready? Go. Supposedly at the bottom of the ocean, they're actually walking the upturned boat along the surface. Are you excited? Yeah. Kind of the strong side of time he is. So there you have it. Hollywood's special effects uncovered. A physics-defying sequence made into reality with some clever behind-the-scenes work. It's all a bunch of movie magic we've done for your benefit. <laughs> movie magic thing's pretty cool. I'm really thinking we can make a go for it. What do you think? Sure, why not? Let's make special effects wizards. <laughs> you know, Adam, it's perfectly clear. There's just no way that two men could hold a boat underwater if it's got a pocket of breathable air in it. It'd be too buoyant. Right, and it didn't work with the dam either. Yeah, so the myth is busted? Busted, totally busted, busted. Pirates are an intrinsic part of modern-day entertainment. I mean, who doesn't love a camp pirate musical extravaganza? But let's not forget, back in the day, they prowled the high seas with murderous intent. I taste what I want, and I want what I taste. <laughs> Crossing paths with a corsair could be fatal in any number of imaginative ways. But surely the worst was the mythical sand necktie. Buried to the neck, the incoming tide ensured a gruesome, claustrophobic death. Or did it? Tortuga Tori, up to his neck in it, is attempting to find out. This is scary, I'm not gonna lie. 
But despite losing his head for the five minutes he was locked in position, Tori eventually manages to free one of his arms. Hey! Oh my gosh. There you go. It's a good start. You know, if you can get one hand free, you can dig yourself out. Ugh. Now that I have my arms free, I feel much better. Tori may feel better, but freedom is still a long way off. Well, we're uh, a little bit past the 30 minute mark. He seems to be doing pretty well, except I'm noticing that he's digging in and then he has a cave in. And it's like he has to start all over again. Every time I move, sand falls in on me. It's great. Like that. <laughs> yeah! I'm back where I started. One step forward, 20 step back. Okay, 66 minutes. This is ridiculous. God. Oh. You know what? I welcome the tide now. With Tori ready to end it all, Carrie and Grant step up to boost morale. Right, here we have a very rare sight the burrowing Belechi. He's almost formed his little burrow, and that'll be his home for the next five years. And what do you know? The burrowing Belechi musters his energy and... <laughs> yeah! 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 All right, that is 86 minutes. After an hour and a half of extreme science, Tori must be feeling <laughs> on top of the world, right? Gosh, this whole experience uh, pretty much sucked from the beginning. Uh, the only time it sounded kind of fun was when we were in the office saying, hey, do you want to get buried up to your neck in sand? And I was like, yeah, that sounds kind of fun. But getting out of it was really hard. Uh, it's taken me over an hour to dig my way out of this hole. The escape casts doubt over the myth that the infamous sand necktie will give you a bad case of dead. But Tori was buried in dry sand, well away from the incoming tide. Until they test the lethality under those conditions, this myth is still alive. do if they were in a battle and they ran out of cannonballs? They'd improvise. You know, they'd just grab anything they had handy and shove it down the barrel. <laughs> that sounds like something we should test. You got it. In this movie myth, when the ship hits the fan and there's no cannonballs left on board, you can supposedly blast your enemy with whatever's on hand. But what would happen in real life? Would this improvised ammunition lead to a ballistics bullseye? Or is it just fantasy physics? Well, accepting pirate booty, what would you find on a pirate ship that you could cram down a barrel and fire at your enemies? Well, let me think. The first thing that comes to my mind would be silverware, like cutlery. Oh, that's good. I guess if you were desperate, you could use bottles of rum and wine. Chain. Nails. Well, and then if you're really hard up, I mean, you are a pirate after all, so you could take off your wooden peg leg and you could fire that. Well, you'd have to be very, very desperate, but that sounds great. Let's try it. As plans go, this one's as simple as it gets. Jamie and Adam will gather the ad hoc ammunition they've chosen to test. It's a genuine bona fide pirate peg leg. And make their way down to the Alameda County bomb disposal range to fire it from a cannon. And the artillery in question has a familiar muzzle. Look at that. Boxing an old friend. How you doing there, old buddy? Of course, old friend, old Moses, and cannoneer Harry Webb have had a blast with the Mythbusters before. And because they can do that, it's no surprise they've been invited back. My buddy old Moses here is a replica of an 1841 six-pound ball cannon, and it fires that six-pound ball at about 900 miles an hour. So 
Henry, are you okay with us shooting pretty much anything we decide to put in the cannon? Certainly within reason. I mean, it's, it has to be under three and a quarter inches and under 12 pounds just for the stress of the gun. But anything you can fit down there that qualifies for that is fine with me. So today, we're actually gonna hopefully use Old Moses to demonstrate a bunch of impromptu cannon loads. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're speaking my language there. <laughs> I think I thought you'd like that. With Harry's blessing, they can begin prepping Old Moses for firing. And unfortunately for everyone within earshot, Adam can get into character. What are you doing with my cannon? Hold it right there. Now, who told me that we had no cannonballs? I want you to take everything we've got on the ship, shove it down that barrel, and shoot it in that boat. Well, don't just stand there. Are we gonna have to listen to this all day? Yes. On location at the bomb disposal range. What do you mean we ain't got no cannonballs? Jamie and Adam are on course for some Caribbean cannonball chaos. It's a bit hot being a pirate. They're testing the myth that improvised ammo will work in place of regular cannonballs. Perfect! And to do that, they need a target some way of gauging and comparing the performance of the different types of ammo. If you've watched Mythmasters before, you know that pigs are often used by them as human analogs. Lucky for us, there's not a big difference between humans and pirates. So he makes an excellent pirate analog. And now, a short break to hear from our partners on the Pirate Channel. Welcome back, Pirates, to the Pirate Channel's Household Hints. If you're like me, you found yourself in the heat of battle without a cannonball, and I'd like to suggest a few things you might shove down that barrel for maximum damage. Of course, you can run to the mess hall and use whatever pirate cutlery you've got. I like this method just fine, but if I've got steak knives, if my men are eating well, these are much more effective. Nails are also very good. Shove a bunch of them down the barrel so like a pirate flechette gun. I like the chain for eliminating five or six people at a time off the deck. And if your pirates subscribe to the Geneva Convention, the only pirate rum is ideal because it creates wounds that are free disinfected. Grape shot is, of course, the most loveliest, but if you find yourself without any of these, don't fear. Oh. You can always use your own peg leg as a weapon. While Adam's been working on his career in daytime pirate TV, right, Jamie's well, done, you know, some work. You want sawdust, sawdust in there? Put sawdust in the middle of it. Under the careful tuition of our resident cannon expert, Harry, he's packed the ammo for the first test. First up is grape shot. This is kind of a control because this is an actual thing that pirates would have used. They're basically just balls, and you shoot a whole bunch of them out of the cannon. It's kind of like a great big shotgun. And for a great big shotgun, you need lots of gunpowder, which the team carefully load before sliding the grape shot canister down the barrel. Well, Piggy's looking pretty dashing there in his striped shirt. Fire one ready, let's do it. Okay, let him have it. Okay, it. test number one. Remember, this is a control using right. legitimate period accurate ammunition. It'll be the point of comparison for what's to follow. Fire it. three, two, Oh, 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 oh. oh, wow. <laughs> All right. I think it hit him. I'm pretty sure that's a palpable hit. Yep, Porky the Pirate took a hit. A hit with at least enough force to knock him off his hook. The grape shot did exactly what I expected it would do. They behaved like little cannonballs. They ripped right through the pig. Didn't even know it was there. I, 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 I. I, I don't have anything to say about this. It's astonishing. Oh, look, really, you should just be watching the high speed. Check out the high speed. Do you see what I'm talking about? This grape shot is, is deadly. That's our control. That's what we're going to compare all the other types of things we're shooting out of this cannon to. So what's next on the menu? So in the middle of a battle, you haven't got anything hard or metallic to shove in your cannon. Maybe you go for the stores, and we thought, broken glass. So what we've got is bottle of red, bottle of white, whatever kind of mood you're in tonight. But Jamie thinks this movie myth is going to go up in smoke. 
the glass is going to shatter right off the bat. The shock wave is going to disintegrate the glass. The liquid is just going to vaporize. I wouldn't be surprised to see just little flecks of glass on the pig, and that's about it. You like your pork marinated in wine? Firing! Three, two, one! Wow! <laughs> that's so percussive. Did uh, someone they... mention percussion? Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. With artillery explosions written into the score, it's the perfect Mythbusters soundtrack. Exactly what I said it was going to be. He's got little flecks of glass on the surface. Oh, there's one that actually went in a little bit. It looks like it, right through the claw. Ugh. Gross. I didn't have much hope for the wine, and it actually delivered even less than I was thinking. Um, we've got a couple of little flecks of glass embedded in his flesh. He smells like wine, but in a battle, honestly, you're better off you're better off throwing things at your opponents than just trying to fire wine through your cannons. I don't think you'd die from that. No, yeah, it would hurt, but it's not like you'd kill a whole bunch of people. You'd no. have a bunch of people who were annoyed and smelled like wine. Yeah, and they'd be kind of bloody. <laughs> Let's set up again. Okay. So bottles of grog are busted as improvised ammo. But that's only the first item on this menu of mayhem. Adam and Jamie are tackling the tall tale of improvised ammunition. They have a period-accurate cannon, a pirate pig for cannon fodder, and a range of mythical movie-inspired ammunition. Really, you'd have to say they're on the cutting edge of screwing around. So what's next to test? I tell you what I want to see from this, why I'm so excited about doing this, is I want to see one of these spoons, like, sticking right out of our pig, our pirate. You gotta figure, things really suck for you at this point. You're loading silverware into your cannons. I think we're gonna see at least one utensil sticking out of our pirate. I mean, we have to. If we're shooting a whole barrel full, we ought to see at least one. So is this a case of what you see is what you get? Or will the real world results match up? Front, three, two, one! I can't get used to that. I know, it's just <laughs> nothing that makes it comfortable. I saw like a whole spray, it was awesome. But a closer look at the scene reveals none of the silverware stuck in Porky the Pirate Pig. I don't see any cutlery in him. Where's all the cutlery? Oh, well, here's the, something. Ow! <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a bit hot, is it? Uh, yeah. Cutlery doesn't work too well. I mean, it's not like it is in the movies where you've got, you know, a fork and a knife and a fork and a knife and a spoon. It does this. It gets all mangled. It goes everywhere. It's not accurate. It's probably lethal to somebody somewhere in the target zone, but it's not like the grape shot where you hit what you aim it at and they're going to be dead. The guys have proved randomly shoving cutlery down the barrel is busted, but silverware still has a shot at making its mark. On the next test, a healthy handful of steak knives is packed into a ballistics-friendly container. That's just scary looking. Look at it. Look at it. All heading right for you. Let's try it. The meat knives are locked and loaded. The target is in place. What's on the menu, Captain Redbeard? that pig. It seems his reputation as a bloodthirsty scourge of the high seas is accurate. But what about a prediction for the test? I like the way the kitchen knives look, but I, I think we might end up with another cutlery spread. What do you think? Stop doing that with your hair. It's creepy. <laughs> Let's fire that puppy. Let's go. <laughs> Firing. Three, two, one. It's always an adrenaline rush. Uh-oh. What? I can see it from here. What? We got damage. We got damage? We got flesh wounds. <laughs> oh, wow. Looks like those meat 
knives are effective at cutting meat. Wow, look at that damage. Yep, on the high speed, the high speed steak knives scythe through their target, aligning them in the canister to keep them compact as they left the muzzle made a huge difference to the result. Oh, we got some good slices, so uh, we could, based on that, say it'd be, definitely be lethal. So, what's next? Well, why not the pirate leg? Ah, good. Here's the thing about firing your own wooden leg at your opponent. You have to ask yourself, how much damage am I really going to do? Because if you don't at least take off his leg, then you've sustained more damage than he has. Because you're missing a leg. I have a newfound respect for pirates, man. This is not easy. But it does lend a certain cachet. You have to be pretty desperate to use your own wooden leg and fire it at your enemy. Much better to take someone else's wooden leg. So that's what you did? You knocked him down and yanked his fake leg off? Exactly, but we got a problem. This is uh, wider than the barrel. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, I picture the situation as totally desperate. You're just like, right, lads, get my leg off. You take your leg off and just shove it in the end of the barrel and yell, fire! We don't have to cut it or anything, just boop, and see what happens. And what happens what? is... I don't see anything! The peg leg ceases to exist. Where's my peg leg? I see a lot of little splinters all over the yeah. place. With a pound of 1F black powder sending an explosive shockwave at 900 miles per hour along the 60-inch barrel, it's no surprise the peg leg went away. No, pirates, never use your wooden leg in a firefight. <laughs> this is a public service we've done here. Tori has found out if you're up to your neck in it, life can be a beach. Hey! Oh my gosh. But he did escape, casting doubt that the mythical pirate punishment, the sand necktie, is a certain death sentence. Yeah! Troy didn't pass out, but he did get out. It just took him an hour and a half to dig his way out. Yeah, but that was dry sand, and this myth is about wet sand. So I think the next logical step is to bury someone up to their neck in wet sand and see if they can escape that. Yeah, but I think it's just too dangerous to bury somebody that close to the waterline. Maybe what we should do is build a box, fill it with wet sand, and have some kind of mechanism so if the person starts freaking out, we can release the sand and they can get out safely. Okay, so who are we gonna bury? Well, since Carrie's knee's messed up and I'm building the box, Looks like it's you. Arr. So this time, cabin boy Imahara will play the part of prisoner. Well, I'm making a box to hold sand, but it's not a sand box. But with the added weight of the wet sand, there's an increased danger of suffocation. It's Kung Fu carpentry. And Grant may need to get out fast. So it's over to our resident Kung Fu carpenter. Has he got a plan to ensure Grant lives to myth bust another day? If he does freak out, if he can't breathe, something goes wrong, we need to get him out quickly. We're gonna have uh, straps around all the walls that are gonna hold the, the box together. We pop the straps and the wall will collapse and the sand will come out and we'll be able to rescue Grant. The sand chamber is complete. <laughs> <laughs> While Grant and Tori dream of world domination, let's get back to the beach. Grant, we need a new cam boy, so we're getting rid of you. Where they set up the sand chamber, ready for Grant's incarceration. All right, here's the plan. Step one, we build the box. Step two, we put Grant in the box. Don't knock on the glass. It upsets the fish. Step three, we fill up the box up with sand and water, and then we see if Grant can get out. I await your punishment. I have a feeling, Grant, this, this is the last we're going to see, Grant. I'm going to miss him. Yar, I be the scurvy dog. While Grant wanders off to find some limes... Where's Grant? Tori brings in the mechanical digger to start loading up the sand. And Carrie and Grant organize the water pump to simulate sand conditions close to the shoreline. You know, wet. Hi, Captain Limpy. Throw it over the side. What are you calling me? Captain Limpy. That's what everybody else is calling you. Behind your back. 
All that's left to do is for Grant to put on his wetsuit. Hey, make sure you cover the poop deck, okay? <laughs> Come on. Get back in his box. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> that's an interesting experience. And wait patiently as Carrie and Tori... It's like watering a little Grant flower. <laughs> ...add enough water and sand to bury him to the neck. This is a very interesting feeling. I cannot move my arms at all. Uh, I can wiggle my toes and I can wiggle my fingers. All right, this is feeling pretty good. What do you think, we let him go for it? All right, pirate, dig your way to freedom. All right, here I go. I will be playing the part of the tide. Woo, splash, splash. I got my fingers, I'm making a little finger space, I'm trying to head towards the stomach. And in fact, I'm making use of my arm being straight up and down as a path to the top and moving my shoulder, which is working pretty well. Safe in the knowledge he can call for the quick release, Grant coolly tries to think his way out of his beachside jail. I think I can do this. Tide's coming in. But that early confidence is misplaced because after 10 minutes of desperate struggling, Grant realizes he may as well have been trying to stop the tide coming in. Uh, you know what? What are you thinking? It just hit. I had two open cavities down by my fingers. Uh -huh. They just filled in. I got two fists full of sand and I can't move anymore. The higher density of the wet sand, plus the water Carrie and Tori are adding to simulate the incoming tide, seals Grant's hands and his fate, which leaves just one option, the Crab Whisperer. We'll call to his legion of crab allies to help dig him out. That's not a crab call. Everybody knows that. Or not. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. All right, let's get him out. How are we gonna get him out? We'll test the uh, safety mechanism. Okay, I'm getting way far back. We'll see how fast it really takes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody stand back. This thing might explode. Okay. You ready? I'm ready to see this. Okay, here we go. Stand back, everybody. Three, two, one. <laughs> While Grant enjoys an endorphin high from his near-death experience, Tori can explain why this myth was confirmed. The water is a key factor in this whole experiment. Uh, if the water is continually washing over the person buried up to their neck, there's no way they can get out. The sand just continues to fill up those gaps because the water keeps pushing the sand into those gaps. Uh, so, if you're buried up in your neck and you're close to the shoreline, you're pretty much dead. <laughs> All right, this one's looking confirmed. You can't dig your way out of wet sand. And I think you would drown before you'd asphyxiate from the pressure on your lungs from the sand. So all in all, this is a very dastardly punishment or death. That's confirmed. Adam and Jamie have been playing with big guns and improvised ammunition. But so far, the cannonball chaos myth has yet to live up to its movie inspiration. The wine bow, the cutlery, the steak knives, they tend to kind of break apart into little bits. They get mangled. They don't stay together in one compact unit. You don't get maximum penetration because of that. You get just litter. So, I'm not really satisfied yet. What's next? Nails. Nails. Ye oldie nails. Ye oldie nails. Let's set up for Jamie's ye oldie flechette gun. If you're wondering, flechette, literally translated from the French, means little arrow. So, flechette rounds are small darts, needles, or nails. And Jamie has the chance to fire this supersized flechette gun. <laughs> Now a cannoneer, sir. Thank you. <laughs> That's kind of intense. Isn't it tense? Yeah. And I kind of think we did something to the pirate this time. But did it, like in the movie, do enough to be useful in a full-scale firefight? 
Oh. oh, that's bad. Now that is a mortal wound. After all that we've fired at this intrepid pirate, I have to say, ye olde nails are almost as deadly as the grape shot. Look at this. Look at the damage they done to this poor bloke. That's awful. Nice big heavy nails like that, you don't want to be in front of them. No, no. And they now. stayed, it looks like they stayed pretty contiguous because they ripped him to shreds. More, what's next? Next are lengths of chain, a perfectly legitimate thing to find on deck. And Jamie thinks it's Porky the Pirate Pig's worst nightmare. If there was one thing that I wouldn't want to get hit by coming out of a cannon, it would be this. It's strong, it's massive. I don't think it's gonna pull apart. And if it spreads out when it comes out of the barrel at 900 miles an hour, it'd be cutting you in half. Here we go, this one's for glory. Three, two, one. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Roar! <laughs> Let's go look. Wow! Dude, that is wrong! Wow! <laughs> that is so wrong! I walked up, I thought it looked totally fine, and then you spun it around and I saw that everything I couldn't see wasn't actually there. That's about the most gruesome damage we've ever done to one of our uh, pirates and pigs. One of our, any of our test subjects. That's yeah. horrifying. That kicks the, 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 the grape shots, but kicks it down the stairs and takes its lunch money. Gruesome indeed. Friends and family of Porky the Pirate may wish to look away now. Quite simply, of all the improvised cannon ammo tested, the heavy duty chain was easily the most effective. It actually behaved like a bullet. It just passed right through him, it ricocheted off the hill, landed in the grass a couple hundred feet away, still in one piece. So where do we stand on cannonball alternatives? The lightweight stuff didn't fare so well. I mean, uh, the peg leg, the wine bottle, the uh, silverware, they just don't have much mass. They kind of disintegrated. I wouldn't want to stand in front of it, but uh, not so good. Whereas the sharp stuff and bladed stuff, like the steak knives and the nails, was actually somewhat effective. Yeah, and then the absolute most terrifying thing in the whole deal was that chain. It was oh, just horrible. Without a doubt. In fact, I'm packing chain for every pillaging trip I take. Pirates. Arr! We've done some good work here. Arr! It ought to tide the fans over for a little while. Arr! What's your favorite letter of the alphabet? L. And sometimes Q. See you next time.